going on everybody it's timothy here with mana rocks and we are jumping into part two of our throne of eldraine limited set review if you want the whole spiel you can go check out part one but we're trying to keep these videos a little bit shorter than that one so we're probably going to jump right in here in a second remember if you want more content like this if you appreciate this set review if it helps you in any way shape or form feel free to subscribe to the channel for more um, comment below if you see anything missing from this channel, if I missed a card or if I'm misevaluating a card in your opinion, feel free to comment below and find us on Twitter at MTG underscore Manorox. So again, real quick, we are going to rank these in order from what I consider to be the weakest, most build around cards all the way up to the strongest cards. And we're going to go through every single blue card in Throat of Eldraine. So thanks for joining me today. Let's get into some blue cards. Remember, we start off with the sideline cards. These are the cards that we're not super excited to play unless we have the deck that really works with them. So we're including our build arounds here. The ones that just don't function unless we have the right card kind of cards to make them tick. And we also have our sideboard cards, which we don't put in the main board, but they're going to be pretty decent when we do bring them in against certain opponents. Let's start off with Merfolk Secret Keeper. Uh, people are going to love this card, and I'm going to hate it. It's a single blue mana. For a 0-4 common merfolk wizard, it's, uh, yeah, 1 mana 0-4, a kraken hatchling. Not a very good card. Doesn't even really do what you want it to against aggressive decks, since they will often just get enough creatures that can attack through it. And sure, this will be able to block one, but then it's kind of like a bad tapper, and it doesn't really do very much against big creatures or evasive creatures, so not really what I'm looking for. It does have an adventure tacked onto it. A single blue mana to cast Adventure Deep, which is a sorcery. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. Now, maybe I'm missing something. We'll see a couple other mill cards, but not very many. There's a minor, minor, minor theme of milling your opponent. In fact, Blue Black has kind of an archetype that cares about how many cards are in your opponent's graveyard, but there's not a lot of payoffs for it, and this is definitely not the best way to feel that strategy. If somehow there's a mill deck and I'm missing it, um, and maybe a bunch of these makes a real deck, then let me know. But uh, Blue Black isn't really looking to mill the opponent out. It's looking to just fill up their graveyard and turn on your cards. So uh, as of right now, the Merfolk Secret Keeper gets a big thumbs down for me, unless uh, the Blue Black deck tends to want this card uh, a much higher rate than I'm giving it credit for. Mirror Maid is up next. Probably a pretty strong card, but very situational. It's one blue blue, three mana total for a rare enchantment. You may have Mirror Maid enter the battlefield as a copy of any artifact or enchantment on the battlefield. So it's here for a pretty obvious reason, right? If you personally don't have any artifacts or enchantments in your deck or any that are worth copying, then Mirror Maid is not a card that should go in your deck. If you just have random equipment and you don't have super splashy artifacts or enchantment, maybe just some dorky enchantment creature or rather artifact creature, um, then yeah, Mirror Maid is not a card you really want in your deck. It can copy your opponent's stuff, but I would rather wait and see that they have stuff worth copying before I put Mirror Maid in my deck. Now, obviously, there are some really powerful artifact creatures in this set and some artifacts that are worth copying, some enchantments that are worth copying, uh, removal spells, so on and so forth. So if you see those from the opponent, then go ahead and bring this card in. Or if you actually have those cards in your main board, then you can main deck a Mirror Maid as well. But this is not just a clone. You would play a clone in every single deck because creatures are going to come up in every single game, but artifacts and enchantments don't necessarily do that. Plus, you can get blown out sometimes if you try to put this on the stack and you have just one artifact or enchantment and they blow it up in response and then there's nothing else to copy mirror maid will just sit here doing basically nothing and be a blank enchantment so watch out for that even though it won't come up that often midnight clock another rare is tuna blue for an artifact you can tap it to add blue mana so already that's something right and i'm gonna go ahead and uh uh, be completely um, honest. I don't think this card is bad. I think it's just extremely slow. I think this card could be very, very good and might be one of the kind of sleeper bombs of the set, depending on how fast or slow the set ends up being. But at the very least, you're paying three mana for a mana accelerant. And blue doesn't normally want that sort of thing, but maybe you're playing blue green, maybe you're playing bigger creatures, or you have some mana sinks and stuff like that. And Midnight Clock is at the very least a mana rock, while also being an artifact for your artifact synergies. It has two and a blue, put an hour counter on Midnight Clock. So we'll see what that means in a second. At the beginning of each upkeep, 
put an hour counter on midnight clock. So that includes your upkeep and your opponent's upkeep. Plus, you can pay three mana to put additional hour counters. And here's what you get. When the 12th hour counter is put on midnight clock, shuffle your hand and graveyard into your library, then draw seven cards and exile the clock. So this is a very powerful effect, right? On its own, let's say you never pay three mana to put an additional hour counter on this, and you play it, you have to wait six full turn cycles before this is going to trigger, right? You get one on your opponent's upkeep, then one on yours, then one on your opponent's upkeep, one on yours, so on and so forth. So six turns down the line from when you cast Midnight Clock, you're going to go ahead and sacrifice it, or rather exile it, and you're going to draw a new hand. You are going to ditch the cards that you currently have in your hand, right? This gives your opponent a lot of time to try and be as aggressive as possible, but the upside here is that you can actually put additional hour counters on it. You can keep it moving, right? So as long as you've got the board kind of stabilized and you can kind of control things a little bit, use your hand, right? Go ahead and kill your opponent's creatures with whatever you have, cast whatever creatures you can, play as much of your hand out as possible, and use your remaining mana to put a uh, hour counters on midnight clock and then eventually you'll just draw a new hand you do shuffle your graveyard back too which could matter um but overall very powerful effect just extremely slow it doesn't take a genius to wonder why this card is not just a straight up bomb um if you're playing against a hyper aggressive deck and you play a midnight clock you're probably not going to get there right the game will either be so far in your favor already since you haven't died that you don't need the midnight clock or you're just going to be dead because you're casting cards like this and using mana to put hour counters on the clock. But I think the failsafe that this is a mana rock and accelerant and can get you to your five and six drops a turn earlier, and it's an artifact on top of that and a color that really cares about it, means that it's already playable as kind of a bad mana lith, if you will, and then has this pretty massive upside of just drawing you an entirely new hand. Um, you know, a plus six or plus seven or something like that. So I think this card might be a sleeper. I'm not sure what other people's opinions are about it, but I wanted to take the extra time to talk about it because I do think it has a lot of power here. It just um, going to be very situational in a card that you might want to board out against certain aggressive decks. All right, keep the rares coming. This is Folio of Fancies, <laughs> one in a blue for a rare artifact. A, players have no maximum hand size. This really doesn't matter in uh, Limited very much, although it could matter for this card specifically. You can pay X, X, and tap it. Each player draws X cards. So you can pay two mana to have everybody draw one card. You can pay four mana to have everybody draw two cards, so on and so forth. Basically, as many cards as you want everybody to draw, you pay twice that much mana. And then you have an alternative activated ability, Two and a blue, tap it, each opponent puts a number of cards equal to the number of cards in their hand from the top of their libraries into their graveyard. So this card, excuse me, this card alone leads me to believe that there might be a viable mill strategy in this format, but it really hinges on whether you have this card or not. So using this just as a way to kind of feel the blue-black deck seems extremely slow. Two mana to cast this, three mana to activate it. Plus, if you activate the first ability, you're actually drawing your opponent cards, and that's usually not a thing I want to do. I don't know, right? But this could be mill five, mill six, mill seven, right? And doing that a couple times does kill the opponent. So if you're able to completely lock down the board, maybe you're playing those secret keepers, you're playing some zero fours and actually getting your mill on pretty early, then yeah, maybe Folio of Fancies could actually be your win con. Um, it draws you cards as well if you want to use that ability, but you primarily want to be using the second activated ability to mill your opponent out. Of course, if they're playing with an empty hand, if you're playing against an aggressive deck, and they're just able to completely dump their hand, drawing them extra cards is not a good thing, and you're just not going to be milling for a relevant amount against an aggressive deck. So uh, if this is your primary strategy, make sure you have a backup plan against aggressive decks, but I could see this being a win con if you know for a fact you're playing against a slower deck. Next up is Emery, Lurker of the Walk. It's two and a blue for a 1-2 legendary merfolk wizard. This one's a rare, and it says this spell costs one less to cast for each artifact you control. It's not a super relevant ability. That's more for constructed purposes, because if you already have artifacts on board and you've gotten to, like, turn three, you could have just cast this card anyway, and you can't use the tap ability the turn it comes in anyway, so not super relevant, but it is a bonus. You might be able to cast multiple spells on the same turn. Who knows? Um, when she enters the battlefield, put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. So fuel in her last ability, which is tap, choose target artifact card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. So 
kind of a neat combination of abilities, but does require that you have a bunch of artifacts in your deck before you even consider playing this. Even if you get the full reduction and you cast this for a single blue mana, all you're getting is a 1-2 with no evasion. That's not really a card that you want to play even for one mana in limited so you need to have artifacts and you need to have artifacts that you care about casting or you need to really really care about self mill which is not um, something that's super prevalent again the blue black archetype is milling your opponent out there are some ways to recur artifacts and enchantments from your graveyard but emery really only works with artifacts and uh, unless you have a bunch of those i'm talking like four plus artifacts i don't think emery is a card you really want to include in your deck even though i will admit she's a sweet card um, overall, but meant mostly for constructive purposes, not for limited. The Magic Mirror. So we mentioned in the white video that every color has a huge legendary artifact that costs a bunch of mana, and it costs one less to cast for uh, a certain number of something related to that color. In this case, the Magic Mirror costs one less to cast for each instant or sorcery in your graveyard. The total cost in cast is six blue, 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 nine mana. That is ridiculous. Um, a, you have no maximum hand size. Again, uh, not super relevant. It is relevant with the rest of the text on this card, but if you're not winning with that, by the time you <laughs> are taking advantage of having seven or more cards, then, you know, you're probably not doing something right. The real effect here is that at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a knowledge counter on the mirror, and then you draw cards equal to the number of knowledge counters on the magic mirror. So this is, uh, I want to say Minds Aglow is the name of the card from M13 or M14 or something like that. Uh, just, uh, you, you draw a card the turn after you play it, then you draw two cards and you draw three. You, you draw, um, one additional card each turn as the game goes on. The problem is that the cost reduction is not the easiest thing to satisfy, uh, compared to some of these other mythic artifacts. For instance, the white one, um, it was already cheap at six mana, cheap enough, I should say. It was castable at six mana, and it costs one less for each knight. Whereas this one costs one less for each instant or sorcery in your graveyard. Um, the, the mana cost is so high, though, and it's going to be pretty late in the game by the time you get three or four instants or sorceries in your graveyard. And even then, this is still pretty expensive. With three instants or sorceries in your graveyard, this still costs six mana to stick on board, and it doesn't do anything the turn it comes down. It's at the beginning of your upkeep, so you have to wait an entire, tur entire turn just to replace this card with another card. And uh, that that's just netting even. That basically you did nothing. You replaced the card with another card. You can tripped for nine mana or so something. Obviously, it gets out of hand uh, after that. And if you have self mill and a bunch of instants or sorceries, you might be able to do something there. Like cards like Emery can self mill you. But what kind of deck has a bunch of self mill, a bunch of instants and sorceries, and I I don't know cares about artifacts. The Magic Mirror does not seem worth it to me. I'm sure there are some very dedicated control decks that can take advantage of this, but this is not a card I'm looking to break in this format early on, and it needs to be an extremely, extremely slow control and format before I'm excited to play this card. All right, so we talked about a bunch of rares already. Let's go ahead and move into our pawns, our filler cards, the ones that we're not super excited to play. We're looking for reasons to cut them out of our deck, but we end up playing them because that's what you get in Limited. First up is Wishful Merfolk, probably a little bit better than I'm giving it credit for. It's one in a blue for a 3-2 common defender. You can pay one in a blue to have it lose defender and become a human until end of turn. Note that there are some synergies in this set that care about non-humans, and this actually changes from a non-human into a human, so there are some things on board that might change, but that's a very, very minor thing here. For the most part, you're getting an overstatted 2-drop that can't attack unless you dump 2 more mana into it. Um, if it couldn't attack at all, if it didn't have that ability to lose defender, I would think this card would be quite bad, like a bad moat piranhas, and I don't already like moat piranhas. Uh, with the added ability, this becomes a pretty playable card. It's nice against, uh, aggressive decks, but blue is not a particularly aggressive color itself, so being able to attack with this isn't exactly great. Um, it is fine, though. It's not a card that I'm looking to have a bunch of multiples. It's just a card that I'm looking to maybe play one or two of against aggressive decks, and then if I find my opponent's playing a bunch of evasion or something like that, I'll just go ahead and board it out. Steel Gaze Griffin, uh, my vote for worst flavor text in the set, by the way, is four in a blue for a 2-4 common griffin, a blue griffin. I don't know if this is the first one or not, but I'm not used to it. It has flying, and it says whenever you draw your second card each turn, Steel Gaze Griffin gets plus two plus oh until end of turn. So 
Um, just of note, blue red in this format, the archetype for blue red is your second card matters. So you get a bunch of cards that trigger or have extra abilities if you've drawn or when you've drawn your second card on any given turn. In this case, you have a very understated flyer that turns into an air elemental whenever you draw your second card. And note that it only counts the second card, not additional cards, so there's no way you're getting this ability more than once per turn. But I don't think this card really pays you off, right? You have to draw two cards a turn just to make this an air elemental, and without it, it's pretty understated. I wouldn't even want to pay four mana necessarily for a two four flyer. Um, that would be a fine card, but not amazing. Five mana for a two four flyer is pretty weak, and sure, maybe you have this sort of deck that can draw extra cards every single turn, but I think every other turn having an air elemental is not great. This is fine to put in your deck, right? It blocks just fine. Sometimes it gets in some extra damage. Sometimes you can be sneaky and use the ability as a combat trick, but that's pretty easy to play around, and overall, I don't think this is an archetype defining card for blue-red. Opt is back. Opt is always back, apparently. It's a single blue mana, instant, common, scry one, then draw a card. We've seen this card in uh, quite a few sets now, Ixalan and Dominaria. Uh, it, it fits pretty well in the blue-red deck, and it fits in the decks that care about having instants and sorceries in your graveyard for all you Magic Mirror fans. But Opt is the type of card that I'm always okay putting in my deck, but never super happy, right? If I'm playing exactly blue-red and I have a lot of these cards that care about drawing my second card each turn, then sure, Opt is a card that I'm looking looking for a little bit higher, but it is kind of a do-nothing card. It is just card selection, doesn't affect the board, doesn't actually give you any card advantage, just kind of helps your other stuff tick, and it's fine, right? It helps you smooth out your draws and just have a little bit more action, but it's never fantastic, right? In blue-red, this is probably going to be a little bit better than we saw it in other formats, but outside of that specific archetype, opt is just opt. It's a card you can play if you want to or if you need to fill a slot, but it's usually one of the cards I end up cutting from my final deck. Mist Ford River Turtle is three in a blue for a 1-5 common turtle. Had to have a turtle. Whenever Mist Ford River Turtle attacks, another target attacking non-human creature can't be blocked this turn. So you can make a non-human unblockable whenever this attacks. It's kind of like a blue loyal Pegasus, or not loyal Pegasus, but a Pegasus Courser, um, if you will. I don't know how I feel about this card. See, the thing is, the effect is obviously pretty good, right? If you can attack with this, which is usually a safe attack due to the amount of toughness it has, you just get to make something else unblockable. But again, blue isn't really looking to be aggressive, right? So this is more of like a blue-green card where you make some aggressive red creature unblockable and then you go in on that. The problem I have with this card is it's a little bit clunky. 4 mana 1-5 isn't even necessarily the best thing you can play on defense since 1 power is just not going to hold back everything. And if you attack with this, your opponent can just gang block it. They can put 3 2-2s two in front of this and it just eats the turtle, right? I think this card's fine. I think you need a very specific sort of deck to make it good. And it can play defense even if it doesn't do that exceptionally well. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about it. It just doesn't seem like something that blue wants. It's more of like a white card or a red card or something along those lines. So maybe a good supplementary color card to keep in mind, but not one that I'm looking to jam in all of my blue decks. Mantle of Tides is up next. I should have mentioned this in the last video, but there is a cycle of um, colored artifacts that I think have conditions to either free equip or they have triggered abilities or something like that. Um, Mantle of Tides is the blue one. It's a single blue mana for an equipment. The equipped creature gets plus one, plus two, and the equipped cost is three. On its own, that's not a card that I'm really looking to play. One mana is the cheapest you can get to get an artifact on board, but three to equip and only plus one, plus two is not exactly game-breaking. It is something. That power toughness bump... You know, that's something. That'll be relevant, but it's not really worth the slot. I'd rather just have another solid evasive creature over that. It has a little bit of a tricky um, ability to it, though. It says whenever you draw your second card each turn, attach Mantle of Tides to target creature you control. So basically, if you can set up a turn where you can draw an additional card outside of your normal draw phase, you get to free equip the Mantle. And on top of that, if you can somehow draw two cards on your opponent's turn, you get to use this as a pseudo-combat trick. 
The problem with that, while it does seem fancy and it seems tricky and it makes people think that this card's probably a little bit better than it is, is that it's easy to play around, right? If your opponent has an attack into your creatures and they see the Mantle of Tides and they see you have open mana and they know you're playing like instant speed draw spells or something like that, they can play around the instant speed equip. So I wouldn't rely on that with the card. I think you mostly want to do it at sorcery speed just to get the free equip on your creatures while you're drawing extra cards anyway. I don't recommend playing more than say one of these if you even want that and I really only want it if I have um, evasive creatures already. Corridor Monitor is up next. It's one in a blue. It's a 1-4 common artifact creature. It's a construct and when it enters the battlefield untap target artifact or creature you control. This is kind of just a mandatory I guess filler slot to make sure that there are enough artifacts in the set it's not particularly strong it gives something pseudo vigilance it can let you reuse an artifact that taps or something along those lines it's fine right it's another blocker just another defensive creature in this set so far we've seen just flyers and defensive creatures with weird aggro abilities on them i don't know how i feel about the corridor monitor i do think you will end up in blue white decks that just want as many artifacts and enchantments as you can get and this one is serviceable but uh, I don't think it's the one that you're actually looking for when you're trying to pick up artifacts. Sage of the Falls is next. Four in a blue for a 2-5 uncommon merfolk wizard. When it or another non-human creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. So every non-human that enters the battlefield lets you loot. Um, for some reason, I misread this card. This should be probably a little bit higher. The stat line is not exactly great. The non-human thing is, again, very weird. But 5 mana, 2, 5 on its own. That just loots when it enters the battlefield. Not a super exciting card. That body is not exactly where I want to be on turn 5. Um, whether I'm playing aggressively or defensively. I think I missed that this triggers on your other creatures entering the battlefield. There are times where you just get to loot through your whole deck because you just played out a bunch of creatures, and that is deserved of a higher grade than where I currently have it. So ignore its spot right now. This should probably be bumped up one category, even though I don't think it's a super, super powerful card. You do have to have creatures basically constantly hit in the battlefield, and it doesn't trigger off your humans, which is basically a flavor thing, but... uh is kind of annoying when it comes to limited overwhelmed apprentice speaking of humans is a blue mana for a one two it's an uncommon human wizard when it enters the battlefield each opponent puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard then you scry two I like this mostly as a mini omen speaker. A 1-2 is worse than a 1-3, but a 1-drop that can just kind of smooth your draws, let you keep riskier hands while also working with the blue-black strategy of milling your opponent to get your card effects online seems fine. I would not overload on this card. I don't want more than probably one of these unless I'm extremely dedicated to try and mill my opponent, um, and then I need some really powerful payoffs for doing so. This is not a particularly good top deck, but I do like when you get this Scry 2 attached to your early game creatures. That way, if you draw them later in the game, they have some sort of advantage. Again, Omen Speaker is a very similar card here. Um, I don't have much else to say about this. I'm looking to play at most one. And again, if the mill strategy ends up being a viable thing, then this card gets a little bit better. But mill 2 is not exactly where you want to be in that strategy either. Mystical Dispute is two and a blue for an uncommon instant. It costs two less to cast if you target a blue spell with it, and the effect is that you counter target spell unless its controller pays three mana. So mana leak, that costs three mana, or it costs a single mana if you are targeting a blue spell with it. So very good in the mirror match, obviously. We'll see another counter spell here in just a moment. I think this one's a little bit worse because it has the same problem that all mana leak type counters have in that in the late, late game or the mid to late game, it drops off. Your opponent might just actually have three mana up. Think like Convolute in M19 or rather M20. Uh, sometimes your opponent just has the mana to pay for Convolute and you can't even cast it. It is decent earlier in the game, and against blue decks, it's going to be an absolute beating against some of their more expensive stuff, so I don't think it's unplayable. I just think in dedicated blue decks, you would rather have the other counterspell we'll see here than this one. Um, it is worth noting, we'll mention this again with the other counterspell, that there's a decent number of flash cards in this set, especially in blue, and counterspells do work nicely in blue, but that doesn't stop the downside of this counter, where your opponent might just actually have the mana to pay for it and kind of null it out. 
All right, moving into the solid playables. These are cards that you're starting to get a little bit excited about. You will pick them pretty happily, and if you wheel them, you're usually quite fine with it. Um, worth noting, there's a ton of cards in this category. So starting us out, we have Witching Well. Um, I think this is going to be a pet card of mine, and I think basically everyone's going to be happy to play this card. It's a single blue mana. It's a common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, scry two. And then for four mana, for three and a blue, you can sacrifice it to draw two cards. This is just kind of a nuts and bolts card advantage type card, right? It has very, very little setup cost. The investment of a single blue mana and the scry two on top of it is very, very nice. The total effect here you're getting is five mana, scry two, draw two cards, right? Which for five mana would not be a particularly good card, but this has a couple advantages. First off, it's in an installment plan, right? You can just find a blue mana at some point during the game and stick this onto the battlefield. Plus, you get the advantage of scrying too, similar to the apprentice that just smooths out your draws, makes it a little more likely that you're going to draw into what you need to, or let you keep a slightly riskier hand or a slightly sketchier hand if you have some islands and a witch and well in your opening hand. And then later, when the coast is clear, when you've stabilized, you can cash this in for two extra cards. So it does just net you extra cards later in the game while also making your early game a little bit better. I like that already, but it's also a very cheap artifact on top of that. So I would play this card if I had no artifact synergies. I wouldn't play like a thousand of them, but I'd play one or two. And then once I have artifacts energies, this card goes way, way up because it's such a cheap investment and it does enough for what it, uh, for what it is, for what you pay that I'm happy to play it. Against aggressive decks, this isn't the best card. It's not the uh, card that I'm actually wishing for, or wishing for rather, but um, it's going to do its job, and I think people are going to be playing this card. I don't expect this card to go very late in the packs. Um, once Eldraine has kind of settled, I think people are going to catch on that this is a good card, and uh, I do, in fact, think this is a quite good card. Ventress Paladin is up next. Three and a blue for a 2-2 two -two flyer. It's a common human knight. All right, four mana 2-2 two -two flyer is not exactly where I want to be. That would be one step below this category, but it's saved by adamant here. If at least three blue mana was spent to cast this spell, it enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it. I believe there's one of these cards in every color, by the way, an adamant plus one, plus one counter card. Um, I'm fairly sure each color has one that turns kind of a weaker vanilla creature into a stronger vanilla creature. In this case, you're actually getting a pretty good upgrade because bigger flyers are better than bigger ground creatures if the only difference is one power, right? Um, what you're getting without paying three blue mana is not really something you want to include in your deck, but what you're getting when you do pay three blue mana is a phantom monster, which is quite good. I'm quite happy with a four mana three three flyer that tussles in the air. It deals a lot of damage and it threatens the opponent. So yeah, I like this card. If you're playing one of the defensive decks, you have all these big toughness creatures, then the Ventress Paladin is a common that I'm highly looking for. Unexplained Vision is up next. Four and a blue for a common sorcery. Draw three cards. That's the whole card. Five mana, draw three, sorcery. If this is a really slow format, then yeah, this is going to be a great card. If this is a very fast format or you're playing against an aggressive deck, yeah, this might not be the card that you want. It also fills the blue-red strategy of drawing multiple cards in the same turn. Drawing any number of extra cards will do that. This is no different. There is a little bit of a bonus. If you adamant this, if you cast it with at least three blue mana, um, you get to scry three. And this one's a little bit weird. Most times we see cards like this, you get to scry before you get to draw. So I'm thinking something like a precognitive perception or Ugin's insight. Those usually let you scry and then draw. This is actually the opposite order. So if you cast this with the adamant bonus, you will draw three cards and then you will scry three. So keep that in mind. It, the, the, the abilities resolve in the order that they're on the card, which is a little bit strange, but, uh, not that bad either, right? It's basically a bonus. You're playing this as a five mana draw three. If you get to scry or if you don't get to scry, that's not too big of a deal. But again, this is going to come down to how aggressive the format is. If it's a very, very aggressive format, then this is going to end up being a little bit weaker. But five mana draw threes tend to be playable cards, especially when they have no downside attached to them. Tome Raider is two and a blue. It's a 1-1 one, one fairy. It's a common with flying, and when it enters battlefield, draw a card. So it's a little bit awkward coming from Cloudkin Seer, uh, which had a relevant creature type, and moving into Tome Raider. 
um, which is one power less than that and does not have a relevant creature type. Uh, worth noting that there's no real fairy tribal stuff in this set. There just happen to be a bunch of fairies, so having a bunch of fairies is not exactly a bonus. Um, just happens to be one, right? This is Sky Scanner, essentially a blue Sky Scanner, and uh, that's a fine card. I think you will play as many Tome Raiders as you can if you're a blue deck. If you have bonuses for playing uh, Flyers, then sure. Um, and on top of that, this fits the blue red deck pretty nicely since if you are casting this, you're very likely going to be drawing your second card for the turn and boom, there are all your blue red bonuses. So if you have those sorts of cards, then Tome Raider goes up in value. Unfortunately though, people are going to be drafting this card very highly. So I wouldn't expect to get a bunch of them. It's basically Cloud Concealer, just a tiny little bit weaker. Um, but that still makes for a pretty good card because a uh, Cloud Concealer is absurd. So tiny is a blue mana for a common aura. It has flash, it enchants a creature, and that creature gets minus two, minus oh. So if that was all this did, it probably wouldn't be a super strong playable, but it'd be enough to kind of pave the way against aggressive decks. If your opponent plays a 2-2, two -two, then so tiny will um, essentially trade for that 2-2 two -two or dumb down a bigger creature and make it more manageable, uh, right? So that your high toughness creatures can block some of the bigger things. Um, it has a little bit of a bonus, though. If your opponent has seven or more cards, or rather if the Enchanted Creatures controller has seven or more cards in their graveyard, this becomes minus six, minus zero instead of minus two, minus zero, and that is much, much better. That basically makes that creature irrelevant. Think uh, Pin to the Earth if you've ever played um, Journey into Next. That card was very good at just making a creature irrelevant. So Tiny uh, is fine. It's also a very cheap enchantment, so I think you will be happy to take this card, but it really, really only does its job as best as possible if you're doing the mill your opponent thing. Um, it is kind of nice that your opponent will just naturally have cards go into their graveyard over the course of a game, and as a game goes on, this might just randomly become minus six, minus zero without you having to put in a lot of extra work, but that doesn't happen until a little bit later in the game. So rely on this being a minus two, minus zero if you're playing it, and then if you can support it, you might be able to uh, push the minus six, minus zero territory, and uh, this will actually become a pretty solid removal spell if that's the case. Run away together. I love this card. I'm a big fan of Peel from Reality or Peel away. <laughs> Peel, yeah, Peel from Reality, right? Bounce a thing you control, bounce a thing an opponent controls. Um, this is similar. It's one in a blue for a common instant. Choose two target creatures controlled by different players. Return those creatures to their owner's hand. So in a 1v1 normal limited game, you are bouncing one creature you control and one creature your opponent controls. Um, couple applications here. First off, you can just use that to reset and enter the battlefield trigger of yours. Pounce a Tome Raider. Get to replay that and draw a card. Bounce your opponent's creature and set them back on tempo, right? You're using this as an unsummon and hopefully using the downside of bouncing one of your creatures as an advantage. If you are not doing that and you are just bouncing one of your own creatures to bounce one of your opponent's creatures, that's a pretty bad tempo hit for you. So you need to get an advantage off of bouncing your own creature. Um, on top of that, we mentioned this in the white video, but being able to bounce your creatures with adventures is pretty nice because then you can cast the adventure half again and then replay that card as a creature once more. So it lets you double up on your adventures by bouncing your own creature back. Again, really only use this if the tempo is in your favor or if you're getting a huge advantage out of bouncing your own creature back to your hand. But it's pretty nice against auras or plus one plus one counters and stuff like that. Kills tokens, yada yada yada, etc. Also, just a side note, in Two-Headed Giant, this is quite good because it bounces one of each of your opponent's creatures without affecting yours at all. So keep that in mind, pre-release players. Queen of Ice. Uh, somehow the card Queen of Ice is a common. Feels like it should be a legendary. But uh, anyway, Elsa is two and a blue for a 2-3 common human noble wizard. Uh, pretty sweet effect here. The adventure half is one in a blue for Rage of Winter. It's a sorcery. It taps a creature, and that creature doesn't untap Dearden's controller's next untap step. That's fine. That's a nice little tempo play. Um, not exactly amazing, right? It is sorcery speed. It does use a decent amount of mana to get that effect. So if you're not being aggro, this is more of a weak defensive option. Usually you want that freeze effect to be an instant so that you can get that creature locked down for the turn you cast it and the following turn. Uh, Queen of Ice is only going to tap that creature down for the one turn. The creature half is a 2-3 three for 3, as mentioned. And when it deals combat damage to a creature, tap that creature... It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. A little bit weird. So 
Queen of Ice will often just trade off if creatures are engaging in combat, but it does let you block a creature um, like a 2-2 or, I don't know, a 2-5, something with higher toughness that isn't going to die, and keep that creature tapped down. It also means if Queen of Ice is attacking and they block the Queen of Ice, but the Queen somehow doesn't die in that combat, then their creature is going to stay tapped down for a turn. So, Overall, I kind of like this effect. It's another adventure creature where if you draw it later in the game and you have five mana, you can use it to tap a creature down, plus also get the Queen of Ice down in the same turn. So kind of a really expensive Frost Lynx, if you will. But um, yeah, I think this is fine. Not a bomb by any means. Doesn't really do what you want it to. Again, uh, blue is not an aggressive color. The creatures just aren't big enough to take advantage of this. So if you end up blue-white, or something like that, then Queen of Ice can be a nice tempo card for you. Moonlit Scavengers is um, very similar along the same lines, just a strong tempo card. Five in a blue for a 4-5 common merfolk rogue. When it enters the battlefield, if you control an artifact or enchantment, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So big mana war, right? If this was not conditional at all, it would be a very good card. Just a 6-mana 4-5 that resets your opponent's best creature is always going to be a card that you'll play at least one or two copies of. It's 6-mana, so you're not going super deep and playing like 4 or 5 of them. But a couple copies of this at your top end would be pretty nice. Um, the sizable stats are there, right? 4-5 for 6 while also setting your opponent back on a, their biggest creature is nothing to scoff at. It does require a little bit of setup, and you need to have an artifact or enchantment, but this is a 6-drop, so if you're really playing this card and you're serious about it, you should be able to get an artifact or enchantment on the board before playing this card, and then just kind of curve into it and set your opponent back. So we see what blue is trying to do here, right? Just keep your opponent locked down, defend the board, maybe get in with some flyers and use tempo cards to get in there, and uh, Moonlit Scavengers is part of that strategy while not being a super, super high pick. Didn't say please. Great name. This is uh, the other counter spell I was talking about. It's one blue blue common instant counter target spell. Its controller puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. So it's cancel with mill three attached to it. Um, you can't mill yourself for what it's worth. Um, that would be kind of nice because there's some self mill stuff going on. But uh, yeah, if you want to cancel in your deck, then this is fine. Uh, the reason I give this a bump above the other one is because it doesn't have the three mana restriction that mana leaks do. And on top of that, like counter spells seem fine in this format. I think it's going to be a slower format. Blue has the tools to really just lock down a board and say no to the opponent. Has a lot of tempo plays, bounce spells, and big dumb defensive creatures. So you should be able to kind of um, leverage your counter spell to take care of your opponent's evasive threat or big bomb or something like that. And uh, on top of that, there are some good flash creatures in the format, so uh, didn't say please plays nicely with flash creatures, and uh, if you have a couple of those, I'd be pretty happy to play a couple cancels as well. Turn into a pumpkin. I think this card's probably going to play out better than I'm giving it credit for, but uh, I'm going to be um, just a little bit unbiased with my uh, rating early on. It's uh, three and a blue for an uncommon instant. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Draw a card. I already love that. I think that's worth the four mana that you're paying at instant speed. And it's non-land permanent, not just a creature, but non-land permanent. And then we get a small bonus. Adamant, if you, if you paid at least three blue mana to cast a spell, you create a food token. So we said this with the white video. Uh, same with blue. Blue is just not a color that takes advantage of food tokens. Um, it does take advantage of artifacts, though, so this is a way to get an artifact on board, which means you probably don't want to sacrifice it right away. You want it to sit on the board um, unless you need the life right away. And then, uh, yeah, you're, you're probably not going to use that uh, food for anything super relevant, but the fact that it's an artifact matters. And if you happen to be playing blue-green or blue-black, there might be some artifact synergy going on, or rather food synergy going on, where this is quite good. I think overall this is a solid card. The reason I don't bump it up into the strong category, even though I really, really like it, is that uh, it's just too slow against some decks. The Food token could matter against those decks and gives you a little bit of extra life, but 4 mana bounce spells do not stop you from dying to an onslaught of creatures. Um, you need actual blockers and stuff, so uh, I don't think you want to jam 15 copies of turn into a pumpkin in your deck, but I would probably play the first two, and if I know my opponent's a slow deck, I'm bringing in as many as I can. Plays nicely with counter spells as well, since you can bounce a non-land permanent and then hold up a counter spell for it on the way back down. Frogify, one in blue, for an uncommon aura. 
enchant a creature, that creature loses all abilities and is a blue frog with base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. Uh, people tend not to like these cards, but I like them a lot when they actually take the abilities away, right? The last time we saw this card, it was Kazamina's Transmutation and War of the Spark, and it did not take away the creature's abilities, which really, really hurt the card. And that was also a set that cared about having plus one counters on creatures, so it didn't even really stop like the army tokens. In this set, I think it's going to stop a lot of what you want it to stop while also being an enchantment for your synergies there. So I think Frogify is a solid removal spell. Blue has a lot of situational removal spells, um, things like Frogify, things like Bounce spells. So you're never really just going to permanently deal with something unless you counter it. But Frogify is a good way to make something irrelevant on the board. Fae of Wishes is up next. This is kind of a janky card for constructed purposes, but it's fine here. It's one in a blue for a 1-4 flyer. It's a rare fairy wizard. You can pay one in a blue and discard two cards to return it to your hand, or return it to its owner's hand, rather. Um, not really interested in that. The reason I gave it this solid playable category is because a 1-4 flyer does kind of stop everything early on. They might be able to attack a bunch of creatures in, but it's going to block all of those aggressive flyers, and we'll see a couple more good flyers in the later half of this video. Um, but it's not great, and I don't think the um, adventure half really saves it. Again, it's meant for constructed, but we'll read it anyway. The adventure is granted. Three and a blue for a sorcery. Choose a non-land, or rather, choose a non-creature card you own from outside the game. Reveal it. Put it into your hand. So you get to take a card out of your sideboard, a non-creature card out of your sideboard, and put it into your hand. There's some applications for that, right? You might just have an extra removal spell in your sideboard, or you might have some situational sideboard card in your sideboard. Um, and this can grab it, and that could be relevant, but it costs four mana to do that. And then your big bonus is that you're getting a 1-4 flyer. That's just not really a solid late game play. I think this card is fine as just a 1-4 flyer for two. If that matters in your deck, if you really want to play defensive, then you can play it, but uh, I don't think you should bank on the uh, sorcery or the adventure being that good. All right, so let's move into our high power level cards. Not as many this time around, and then we've got a couple rares to talk about in our bomb category, but starting off our high power cards, we have Charmed Sleep, one blue blue common aura the enchanted creature taps and it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step uh you might know this card as claustrophobia it's the exact same card with different flavor and it's pretty good right especially in a set that cares about auras it's probably bad against other blue decks or against uh decks that are able to blink or bounce their own creatures but against big green decks and big red decks and you know some n nasty like lifelinker or something like that out of black uh, this can be a good way to just stall the creature. Usually when we see claustrophobia, it just ends up being one of Blue's best commons, basically de facto, right? It just ends up being a solid way to deal with the creature. And unlike some of the pacifism effects, this taps it down so you can actually attack through it too, which isn't a huge deal for Blue, but is a huge deal for other colors. So yeah, Charmed Sleep is going to be a solid removal spell. Definitely Blue's best option at common for taking care of creatures. Sire Eleonora, the discerning, is three blue blue for a star four. It's an uncommon legendary knight, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So five mana, X four, draw a card. The X is equal to the number of cards in your hand. At the very minimum, this will be a one four that can trips. That's not amazing, but it's fine, and it has higher upside of being possibly a 3-4, four, 4-4, four, four, et cetera, et cetera. On turn 5, this is often just going to be a 3-4 four, or 4-4 four, four that drew you into an extra card, and I think that's already pretty good. It also has the kind of uh, Frost Titan ability where spells your opponent's control cast, uh, or spells that your opponent's cast cost two more to cast if they're targeting Sire Eleonora. So she has a little bit of protection, um, Boreal Elemental being the most recent version of that. I think this card is just solid. Sometimes it is a 1-4 that cantrips, and that's not amazing if it's like the last card you cast out of your hand. And again, I don't know where it fits in with blue, right? It doesn't have evasion. It has a little bit of a buff against uh, targeted removal spells, but doesn't stop tappers and stuff like that. And it could just eat a removal spell, and that would be the end of it. But it cantrips and replaces itself, so that's got to be worth something. Again, fits into the blue-red deck the same as the Tome Raider. So altogether, I think this makes for a pretty powerful card, even if it is just kind of a ground pounder at its best. Next up is a card that is definitely going to give some people flashbacks uh, to opportunity. It is Into the Story. 
five blue blue for an uncommon instant draw four cards um obviously opportunity costs six mana but in the formats where opportunity was a playable card it was just busted those tended to be very very slow formats so if this shapes up to be the same then this is going to be a very very powerful card kind of the same thing i said with the clock right if you can make the clock work then you're going to just win that game by pure card advantage and into the story is going to be very similar while not just straight up winning you the game um, but they're probably aggressive decks, so I don't think you can just go all in on this card like you could in Opportunity and M14. Um, there's also a little bit of a bonus, though. It costs three less to cast if an opponent has seven or more cards in their graveyard. So this will cost four mana if your opponent has seven or more cards. Four mana draw four is just absolutely insane, especially at instant speed, on top of all the other things it does in the blue-red archetype and so on and so forth. I think this is probably a very high pick, and I do believe this format is going to be a little bit slower. You need to kind of, um, no pun intended, pick your pick the right opportunity to cast this card. You can't just jam it while you're getting beat down and hope that pure card advantage is going to keep you alive, because it won't. An army of creatures is going to beat an army of cards in your hand, but if you pick your time and right, if you're able to stabilize and kind of control the board, then this is going to refuel you and give you enough resources that you can probably pick out a win. Opportunity was straight up the best card in M14, um, minus maybe like the Mythic Rare Titans, and that says a lot for an uncommon draw spell. Into the Story has the potential to be even better than that, and while I think the format's going to be a little bit different, not just straight up control decks all the time, this is a card to keep your eye out for. You don't even necessarily need the cost reduction for this card to be great. I think there are going to be decks where you're able to cast this, you're able to refill, and you're able to just run away with the game due to the sheer number of cards you have. Hypnotic Sprite is up next. Blue Blue for a 2-1 Flyer. It's an uncommon. That's a fine card. 2 mana, 2 power Flyer is a card that I'm excited to play, even though Blue Blue is not always going to be something you have on turn 2. There's Upside, though. It is a, um adventure creature, so you have the adventure half, which is Mesmeric Glare. 2 and a blue for an instant. Counter target spell with converted mana cost 3 or less. So you get to counter a small spell or play a little fairy and start getting your beat on, or you get to do one and then the other, right? So there are times where it's going to be correct to just play this out on turn two and start getting the damage in, and this damage from a two-power flyer definitely racks up, and there are going to be times where you're playing a controlling game, you don't necessarily care about your opponent's life total, so you're just going to use this as a cheap counter spell for your opponent's first play, and then you're going to go ahead and put it on board. This seems like an absolute beat-in against aggressive decks, because you get to counter one of their cards, and then you get to play this and trade it off for another creature, and that's just a lot of value. I think this card's quite good. Blue Blue is a little off-putting, but that's the price you pay for two power flyers. There's usually a downside associated with it, or a mana restriction attached to it. And uh, yeah, this seems like an ultimately fair card, but a good one. Following up with more powerful flyers, we have Fairy Vandal. One in a blue for a 1-2 uncommon fairy rogue. It has Flash, which uh, I didn't notice the first time I saw this card. It has Flying, and when you draw your second card each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Fairy Vandal. So the first time you trigger this, you have a 2-3 flyer, and that's pretty good. There's enough tools in blue alone to trigger this and get a couple counters on it. And, uh, you know, just a simple divination style card will put a counter on this, which is pretty good. Maybe you can set up a situation where you flash this in, you somehow draw cards on your opponent's turn and it gets a counter and then it becomes a better blocker. But for the most part, this has flash to just kind of play into Blue's theme and uh, lets you kind of untap with it, draw your first card for turn and then use your mana to draw into your second card and just get a good attacker on board. It's definitely made for constructed, but quite good and limited as well. It doesn't need that much support either, right? Get a single counter on this and you have a good card. If you have no extra ways to draw cards in your deck, it takes a hit, but that's not going to be the case in this format. Animate and Fairy, another two power flyer. This one is two and a blue for a two, two flyer. It's an uncommon fairy. So you have another Windrake. We said this in white without any kind of support, without the adventure half attached to it, that would be a playable card, especially when blue has such good ways of just locking down the creatures on the ground. You can get in with all of these two power flyers. Um, the adventure half is kind of intriguing though. It's two and a blue for bring to life. It's a sorcery that lets you target a non-creature artifact you control. It becomes a zero zero artifact creature and you put four plus one plus one counters on it. So essentially you are paying three mana to turn in a non-creature artifact into a four four. Um, and then of course you can pay the three mana to then cast the animated fairy from 
uh, your sideboard, or not your sideboard, from, from Exile while you still have this 4-4 on board. This makes cards like Wishing Well just, like, fantastic, right? Sure, you want to sack your Witching Well. Uh, is it Witching? It's Witching Well for um, card draw. But, you know, being able to play a 1- or 2-drop artifact and then play an Animate and Fairy on turn 3 to turn it into a 4-4 four four and just start jamming on the opponent, you're going to get a lot of damage in. And then they have to deal with that, plus they're going to have to deal with the Fairy on one of the following turns. So, altogether, pretty solid card. Takes a little bit of setup. You have to have artifacts to make it super relevant. But there are times later in the game that you just have a 6-mana play of making an artifact into a 4-4. Four four. And then uh, casting a 2-2 flyer as well, and suddenly you get a ton of value. I think this is going to go very highly, and while it does take a little bit of support, I think it's going to be a good card. Ventress Gargoyle. There's actually a lot to talk about with this card. It's one in a blue for a 5-4. Okay. Uh, it's a rare artifact creature. It's a gargoyle, and it has flying. So two mana, 5-4 flying. Please show me the downside. All right. So first off. It can't attack unless the defendant player has seven or more cards in their graveyard. So you really do want to support this by milling your opponent a little bit, or it just needs to be very, very relevant. Uh, and you need to be able to drag the game on long enough that your opponent's just naturally going to get seven cards in their graveyard. Otherwise, it's not attacking. Um, it can't block unless you have four or more cards in your hand. So in order for this to be relevant in combat at all, you have to have four cards in your hand <laughs> or your opponent has to have seven cards in their graveyard. If both those conditions are met, this is just a two mana five, four flyer, which is absolutely nuts. Absolutely insane while also being an artifact, right? Um, and then it has a tap ability. Each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. So that doesn't help you get any closer to having this block, but it does help you get a lot closer to uh, this being able to attack, right? Your opponent by themselves within the first five to six turns of the game are probably going to get four to five cards in their own graveyard. And then by the time you mill them into a couple extra cards, this should be attacking turn five, turn six, something along those lines. And uh, you don't have to pay any additional mana. It's almost like you just got haste on this thing and you get to start jamming. I think there's going to be a play pattern. I think what you're going to do is you're going to play this on turn two. You're going to make sure that you always have four or more cards in hand so that this thing can block and your opponent won't be able to really attack into it without going through a bunch of hoops. And you're just going to use the activated ability until it can start attacking and you're just going to shoot your opponent down. It's a four turn clock on its own. And if you have any sort of support to mill your opponent out, uh, it's pretty good. I don't recommend playing bad mill cards. Like I don't recommend playing the one mana mill four uh, just to make your gargoyle good because you might not even draw your gargoyle and then you have a bunch of crappy cards in your deck but i think the gargoyle does a good enough job with its activated ability and with a little bit of thoughtfulness that you can kind of sustain the board use its activated ability get up to attack mode and then just start jamming with the gargoyle and win from there i think this card is worth taking i don't think it's a bomb because it does have a lot of setup and there are times where it can't even block which is just a nightmare against aggressive decks so i'm interested to see how this one plays out whether it's just stone cold unplayable or whether it's very well supported and uh, you guys can tell me how it works out for you in the pre-release all right bombs we got three cards to talk about and we'll go ahead and wrap up our blue video starting with stolen by the fey this might uh, I, I don't know what the best card in the set is but this might be pretty close to the best card in the set um stolen by the fey is x blue blue for a rare sorcery return target creature with converted mana cost x to its owner's hand you create x one one blue fairy creature tokens with flying so um if you want to bounce a three drop you have to pay five mana for this you get to bounce your opponent's three drop and then you get to make three one one flyers that's a pretty average scenario and that to me just seems incredible right you get to temple your opponent back you get a bunch of uh flyers on board blockers attackers things to go you know uh pretty wide with some of your mass board pumps and white or something like that that's pretty strong. There are ups and downs to this card, of course. If your opponent is playing nothing but tiny creatures, maybe they're just curving out at three and they have a bunch of twos and threes, you're never going to get like the huge blowout, right? You can't pay more mana for this than the mana cost of the card that you're trying to cast, right? If their most expensive thing is a three drop on board, you can't just pay like all 10 of your mana to make uh, eight fairies or something like that. It has to be exactly the mana cost of the card you're targeting. Um, the downside or the upside rather is sometimes your opponent has a six drop and you have eight mana and you get to bounce their six drop and make six fairies and then you win the game from there right 
Uh, I think this card is very powerful. It's definitely a late game card, but I'm first picking this every single time and I expect it to be very powerful. Even in the situation where you're just bouncing like a two drop for four mana, you get two one one flyers and also get to bounce your opponent's two drop. And that alone is pretty strong with the upside being unreal on this card. So very powerful card. I recommend first picking it and uh, trying to stall the game out until your opponent gets a big thing on board and just kind of upset them while also adding a flying air force to your battlefield. Gadwick the Wizen is up next. This card I think will either have a Rada or there will be some rules change so that it actually works because it doesn't work right now. But uh, you get the idea of what it's supposed to do. So you should be able to play it right. It's um, X blue, blue, blue. It's a 3-3 rare legendary human wizard. When it enters the battlefield, draw X cards. Um, currently under the rules of magic, that wouldn't actually do anything because the X would be zero while it's on the battlefield. It's not a cast trigger. It's enter the battlefield trigger. But you, this card plays how you want it to, right? If you pay blue, 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 and then three mana, you're going to draw three cards when it enters the battlefield. That's at least how the rules will work when uh, this card is released next week. And uh, yeah, that scenario I just described, that is extremely powerful. Six mana, three, three, draw three cards is just absolutely absurd. And the uh, ceiling gets even higher than that, right? You might be able to cast this for five and draw five cards really, really late in the game. And then how does your opponent beat you, right? Plus it's a three, three. That's not terrible. Um, I think your worst, worst case scenario is obviously blue, blue, blue for a three, three, which isn't great, but you should be able to finagle the X is one or X is two, you know, under most board states, unless you're under tons and tons of pressure, you know, five mana, draw two cards, three, three, that's a pretty strong card. You would always be happy to play that. It is blue intensive, but if you have this card in your pool, you can kind of, uh, you make that work out for you. And I haven't even mentioned the other ability. Whenever you cast a blue spell, tap target non-land permanent an opponent controls. This can play defensively or offensively. If you have a bunch of instant speed, bounce effects, or counter spells, stuff like that, then you can kind of play around with your opponent's creatures and make combat a little bit more favorable for you. It's not really the strongest part of this card since it's only at its best if you're playing a bunch of instants. Maybe you end up in that like blue, white, tempo, aggro deck that somehow has a bunch of blue spells and you can tap down blockers and stuff like that. But I think for the most part, you're going to play Gadwick to refuel your hand and then just have defensive options to keep your opponent off your back while you find a way to win. Uh, Gadwick, easy first pick. It does want you to be blue intensive, but make that work out if you end up opening this card. And then finally, uh, probably blue's just straight up best card. Brazen Borrower, one blue blue for a 3-1 flash flyer, and it can block only creatures with flying. That already is a very powerful card. Three mana, three power flash creature. That's just getting in there. It's going to deal three, six, nine damage before your opponent deals with it. Um, it's not the best flash blocker because it can't just trade for your opponent's ground creature. It can only trade for other flyers. So that is a little bit of a downside. But the upside on top of all that is that you get the adventure, petty theft, one in a blue, return target non-land permanent and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So no bounce on your adventure stuff. This only bounces your opponent's um, non-land permanents. And again, not just creatures, non-land permanent could really matter against stuff like the glass casket and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, this card is super powerful. I think people see Mythic Rare on this and they assume it should just have some like off the wall ability and it doesn't. It's just a combination of very strong tempo plays. Bounce your opponent's two drop on turn through get three, get a strong just flash creature and uh, get to just start going to town on your opponent while your opponent has to basically reset up. It also plays extremely well with the counter spells because if this card is sitting in exile waiting for you to cast it, your opponent's just going to assume whenever you keep up three mana that you're going to cast the Brazen Borrower, and they probably won't play around counter spells um, as often as they should, and you can get them with one of the uh, uh, cancels or one of the mana leak type spells. So overall, I think the combination of abilities makes this a very strong mythic, and while it's not the most exciting mythic, you would not want to see this card at rare. It would just come up way too often, and it can be an absolute house. You are going to lose to this card, trust me. Um... That being said, all of these blue rares on screen, they are extremely powerful. Some of the best cards I can think of in the entire set. And uh, you get blue strategy, right? There's a little bit of awkwardness with the aggro decks. Uh, I don't understand why blue has a couple of these random aggressive creatures like the... Uh, 
the the defender merfolk and the turtle but for the most part you're playing defensive you have some extremely powerful draw spells and you have some late game finishers and flyers and stuff like that so blue looking pretty good in the set that's gonna do it for blue we're gonna go ahead and move into black next time we actually get to start talking about some food in depth which is kind of cool um if you're still here thanks for joining me i know these videos go on way longer than they should but i like to get in depth about the cards um let's wrap it up there thanks for watching you can subscribe below if you saw anything that was wrong with the video or if you have any feedback um anything that you think i'm over or under evaluating please let me know in the comments below uh my name is timothy you can find us on mt uh on twitter at mtg underscore mana rocks and uh, i hope to hear from you there so again my name is timothy with mana rocks thanks for watching i'll see you in the next one